Does the Bible teach the Trinity? Well, in today's video, we're going to uncover how the Bible absolutely does teach this triune existence of God, starting from Genesis going all the way through. So this is going to be a couple of parts so that this won't be too long of a video, but we're going to show not just in the New Testament, but also the Old Testament that the Bible indeed teaches that Jesus is God, that God exists as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Hey, my friends, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Uh, my name is Corey Miner, and if you haven't done so already, please, please hit the subscribe button. That way you'll be notified of any future videos. Also, hit the bell notification button and be so kind as to hit a like uh, if you do indeed like the video. And if the video is a blessing or a benefit, please remember to share it with someone. From the very beginning, the Bible teaches this concept of this triune God, this God who exists in this if you will, this plural form. Um, now, depending upon your theology, your belief in this, uh, the very first portion of the Bible may give an indication that God, in fact, does exist as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And though the Bible doesn't use the exact word Trinity, uh, we do know that the Trinity does exist. So what I mean by that is that uh, the Bible says that in the beginning, God, well, the word that's used is the word Elohim. And now, depending upon what your belief is, you'll take that word to be the very first illusion in the Bible that God exists in this plural sense, in this, <clears throat> in this triune fashion. Because the word Elohim with the Yad Mim, the Im part that you hear, uh, typically in Hebrew refers to a plurality. There are three ways that you number in Hebrew. One, there's a singular, then there's a dual, and then there's the plurality or the plural, which is three, four, five, five million, what have you. Well, why would we say that this Elohim refers to that? Because the Yad Mim in Hebrew tends to refer to the plural. So, so the example that, that I, so the example that I may use or that I typically use is that of the word horse, sus. Sus means horse, susayim means horses, meaning two horses, dual, and then susim is plural, three or more horses. And so the word Elohim means or could mean uh, the plur, a plurality. Now, there are some that would say uh, that this, this Yad Mim may not necessarily refer to a plural um, existence, but <clears throat> it only refers to uh, the singular God. Now, I won't go too far grammatically as to why that may or may not be, but suffice to say, depending upon your theology, will determine which way you want to see it. However, if you go forward in the Bible, because if all we had was Genesis 1-1 and all we had was Elohim, then, then it'd be hard to to make the, uh, uh, the case that there is this triune existence of God. But we have more than just Elohim. We have more than just Genesis 1.1. As a matter of fact, if we just go a little further in Genesis 1, we see the Bible saying something that might be a little odd for those who don't accept God as uh, having this, this triune existence. In chapter 1, verse 26, he says, let us make man in our image. Well, there's a problem then if you don't believe that, that uh, God exists in this triune fashion. Because who's the us and the our that God is referring to? Now, and I don't want to get too far into that because I've got a long way to go and a lot of verses to cover, but <clears throat> it seems to say if all we have was Genesis chapter one, that something doesn't quite sound right who speaks in these ways, in the, who speaks in this, in this fashion, let us make man in our image. And of course you see that again in other, in other parts of the Bible where he refers to himself in this plurality, such as in Isaiah, he says, who will, who will go for us? But so the question is not so much, could God exist in this triune fashion? Could, could God exist as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? The question is not, could he? The question is, would he? Well then, so let's see if the scripture kind of 
opens the door for us still so that we can see that more clearly. I think it does. God wants to interact with man. The only problem is he can't because of the fall of man. Because of sin, God can't interact with us the way he did, let's say, with Adam and Eve in the very beginning, whereas they were the only ones who could see the fullness of God. Why? Because at, at one point they didn't have sin. And so they can be in his presence. And we know that man can't be in the fullness of in, in, in God's full presence because of sin. Moses lets us know that. As a matter of fact, we'll actually get to that, that, that verse later on. But if God wants to interact with us, how can he do so? Well, what if he did so in a veiled form? Well, what do you mean veiled form? Well, there's this term that you may have heard before called theophany or Christophany. What that is, is it is an appearance of deity uh, in human physical form. The first time that we see Jesus on the scene is not in the gospel during his incarnation. The first time, the first time that we see Jesus, uh, who I believe is Jesus, and I believe you will too once we go forward, is early on. These appearances of God in human form, and we're going to see him called by many different names or titles. Now, I'll start off with one of the weakest examples, and I'll say this is the weakest example because you can't really point to a whole lot of definite scriptural, scriptural basis to say that this is definitively Jesus or the incarnate Christ, the pre incarnate Christ. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, after Adam and Eve had both eaten of the fruit, we read this. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool on the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. It seems to be saying that they are hiding from a physical person walking, who is physically walking. They hear this sound and they hide themselves from, as they said, as the Bible says, the presence of the Lord God. Well, is it possible that they just heard his voice and hid from it? That's possible also. Uh, is it also possible that they heard this physical walking? That's possible also. That's why I said this is my weakest, weakest example. But let's move a little further and see if I can make the point even more conclusively. We're going to see throughout Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, You'll see it in Deut Deuteronomy, in Judges, Joshua, all throughout the Old Testament, this God showing up and interacting with man. Remember, these are what's called these theophanies or Christophanies, these appearances of Christ or God in human physical form. One such exam example is in Genesis chapter 16, verse 9. Let's go there. This is where the angel of the Lord is speaking with Hagar. Well, why would you say that's God when it clearly says the angel of the Lord? Well, let's read and see if we can glean from this. He says, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, now before, forward, who's speaking? The angel of the Lord. And notice what he says he's going to do. Behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has heard your affliction. But look at verse 13. Then Hagar, she's called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said, I have also seen, I have also here seen him who sees me. So look what Hagar calls him. She says, she calls the angel of the Lord says that you are the God who sees. And she says that I have also seen him who sees me. So Hagar calls this the angel of the Lord. She calls him God. Well, is she confused? Well, let's look at some more verses and see if it's just her. In Genesis 22, verse 11, Abraham, who probably is not confused as to who God is, because remember, God has been speaking to him. He told Abraham to leave out of his father's land into a land that he would show him. So he's fully aware of who God is um, and recognizes him and his voice. And look at chapter 22, verse 11. 
But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So it's the angel of the Lord calling to Abraham from heaven. Verse 12, he said, do not lay a hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Well, wait a second. He uses the personal pronoun me, the angel of the Lord does. The angel of the Lord calls from heaven and says that you have not withheld your only son from me. But in verse 14, Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it should be provided. Look at verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord. So the angel of the Lord is also called the Lord. Now, think about this for a second as we go forward. I want you to remember all these different titles, all these different names and descriptions of God. Who is the Lord? The Lord, not a Lord. There are many people who, who might be a Lord over this town, or over this household, but who is the Lord? There's only one person that's ever been given the title, the Lord, right? That's being God. God is the Lord. But we get to the New Testament and isn't Jesus called the Lord? Well, let's just stick here in the Old Testament, but right here, the angel of the Lord is called the Lord. He's also called God as well. So we see the angel of the Lord being called God and the Lord. So let's keep going to Genesis chapter 31, verse 13. The angel of God says, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and, and where you made a vow to me. So here the angel of God is called God. Well, is the angel of God the same as the angel of the Lord, uh, the same as the Lord? Well, the angel of God is also called God. The angel of the Lord is also called the Lord, is also called God. So the angel of the Lord and the angel of God seem to be one and the same. So now let's go look a little further, one page over in chapter 32. Many of you are familiar with this verse. This particular famous passage is where Jacob wrestles with a man. But let's see if it's just a man. In verse 24, then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Well, who is this man? We'll see. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, that is the man that was wrestling with Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, the man did to Jacob, let me go for the day breaks. But he, that is Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have, look at this, struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob said, or answered, or asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So here we see Jacob wrestling with this man and the man says that your name shall be Israel. Why? Because you have wrestled with God and prevailed. Jacob calls the place Peniel because he says, I have seen God face to face and have lived. So here we see another example of God showing up in the form of a man wrestling with Jacob. And Jacob identifies this person that he's wrestling with as God because he says so. Does Jacob know who God is? Well, I think he does. Um, he's been interacting and talking with God and God is the one who changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And so here's another example of God in the form of flesh wrestling with man in this case. So now let's move a little further. We're going to skip Exodus and I want to go to Numbers and give another example. Numbers chapter 22 um, speaks about Balaam and, and this donkey and the angel of the Lord. And look what it says. Then God's anger was aroused because he went and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. So we see the angel of the Lord 
here standing. And as we read further, I don't want to go too far into it because it's just for lack of time, but we keep seeing what the angel of the Lord is saying and what the angel of the Lord is doing. And let's go down further. So the angel of the Lord is, is who's talking, verse 34. And Malam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it pleases you, I will return back. Keep going down further. 35, then the angel of the Lord said. So we still see it's the angel of the Lord speaking. Verse 38, and Balaam said to Balak, look, I have come to you. Now, have I any power at all to say anything? The word that God puts in my mouth that I must speak. Well, wait a second. I thought this was the angel of the Lord. But here, the man testifies that this was God. More examples? Let's go to Judges. In chapter 6, verse 12, we see Gideon coming in contact with the Lord. Let's look. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you. Here it is again. The angel of the Lord, the Lord. And then drop down to verse 20. The angel of God, so now it departs from the angel of the Lord and the Lord to the angel of God in verse 20, said to him, take the meat and unleavened bread and lay them on the rock. Verse 21, then the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff. So, and I'm just jumping around because I, just for lack of time, but I want to see, I want you to see all the different names and titles that are being used here. Then go to verse 22. And here we see. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. So here we see these examples with Gideon, with Balaam, with Jacob, with Abraham, with Hagar, of God interacting with them. As a man, physical form was as a man who had flesh. We know that because he wrestled with Jacob. And his name is called the angel of the Lord, the angel of God, the Lord, and God. Okay, so you might be wondering how in the world does that even mean that that's Jesus? Well, we'll see in a second. Recall who led the children of Israel out of captivity. So go back to Exodus now, verse 17 and 18. Then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest perhaps the people change their mind. Verse 18, so God led the people. So who's leading the people? God is leading the people, right? Just wanna make sure that's clear. God is the one that's leading the children of Israel out of captivity, right? And then in verse, but, but in verse 21, look what he says. And the Lord, that makes sense, went before them in a pillar of cloud to lead them by the way, <clears throat> and by night in a pillar of fire. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So we see God leading them in this form of this fire and this cloud. That's kind of important because I want you to see the elements that God is also showing up in. It's the Lord who's leading them as a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, right? So now let's go to chapter 14, verse 19. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved between them and behind them. Now this was, this was happening when, the, when the, uh, uh, the Egyptians were getting close to the children of Israel. And so God goes from being in front of them to move behind them. But look what he's called this time, the angel of God. Now let's go to chapter 23 of Exodus. Verse 20, behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way. Now, all angel simply means is just, and the Hebrew word for this is just the word for messenger, right? <clears throat> or also angel. But is this a particular messenger? Well, let's see. 21. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him. For he, this angel, this messenger, will not pardon your transgressions. If you, if you provoke him, this messenger will not pardon your transgressions. You mean to tell me there's an angel, a messenger, who will be able to pardon your sins or your transgressions? Some kind of an angel, huh? For my name is in him. 
But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies. Verse 23, for my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and Hittites and so forth. So now, but he says, my name will be in him. Wait a second. You mean to tell me, God, you are going to put your name into someone else's? That, wait a second. How could that be, God? Because you don't share your glory with anyone else. Oh, I might be getting ahead of myself because I don't want to, I want to use that passage, those passages for next week. God doesn't share his glory with anyone and his name is his and his alone. So why does he seem to be sharing that with somebody else unless he's not sharing with sharing it with somebody else? Remember in the beginning of Exodus chapter three, this is when Moses was tending the flock and he sees something. And let's just read the passage that I want you to make note of who is who and what's what. Verse two, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, appeared to who? The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was not burning. Then verse three, Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight while the bush is not burned. So it's the angel of the Lord appearing in this bush, in this flame. Verse four, so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, appearing in this bush, in this flame. Verse four, so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. Wait a second, I thought this was the angel of the Lord. Then it says the Lord saw, but then God called. So we've got, again, the angel of the Lord, the Lord and God calling out from Moses to Moses out of this burning bush, out of this fire. Because God shows up in the form in this fire. Also, he shows up, we'll see later, um, as Moses meets with him in this cloud. And remember who led the children of Israel out of Egypt? God in the form of this cloud and this fire. And so we'll see him interacting with Moses in, in both in both of these forms. And so clearly God can take on the form of fire if he so chooses, because he does right here. Right. But notice what he's called. He's called the angel of the Lord. He's called the Lord and he's called God. But then later on, when Moses says to him, when you when people ask, who shall I say sent me? What does God say? We all know this. I am. So we've got the angel of the Lord, the Lord, God, and I am. Okay. Well, so, well, the so is, and we'll just go ahead just, just, just briefly. Um, we all remember the passage in John chapter eight, when Jesus said before Abraham was ego eme, which is I am. And the Jews knew exactly what that meant because they took up stones to kill him because he's calling himself God. So even early on, we see God taking on this form of man, of flesh. Because again, the question is not could God, but would God? Is it possible for God to be in heaven? Picture this, God is in heaven. He's also here on earth. In this case, in Exodus 3, he's in the form of this fire. So is it possible that God can be in the fire while at the same time still be in heaven? Well, sure, because that's exactly what's happening here. Is it possible that God can be in the fire, speaking of Moses, his presence still be in heaven, but also his presence because he's omnipresent, still be in Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, is it possible that God can be all over the world, his presence, his spirit, all over the world at the same time? That's possible. Matter of fact, not only is it possible, that's where that's what David even says, where can I go that you're not, your presence isn't. So his presence, his spirit is on earth, his fullness dwells in heaven, while at the same time he can take on flesh, because he did, he took on fire, he, he wrapped himself in fire, but he can wrap himself in flesh and come and die for us. My friends, that is the definition of the Trinity. And so there's more passages for us to see 
because I want to make this not just clear, I want to make it abundantly clear. But for this video, suffice it to say, we see some examples of God showing up in physical form as God.